Hey everybody, this is uh, the last of our uh, sessions in our series in Philippians. I hope it's been, a, as the book uh, repeats a bunch, I hope it's been a joy to you. And uh, these last several weeks has been, I know, something that uh, has been a blessing to many of us. And uh, I hope this format too, the way we've been doing this, has been something that's helpful. So uh, let us know that. Please just uh, send us um, email, or um, or you can, of course, you give us a call. But just put something in the comments as well. Um, we would love to hear how we can more effectively get uh, uh, God's word to you and good godly teaching. Uh, something also too that's practical. You can turn around and use it right away. Um, as we're still very much yes in. Um, the um, the quarantine type thinking and and corona, but I would just uh, encourage you to continue to, to grow in your relationship with God, but also be thinking how can I use this, uh, what I'm learning and growing with my relationship with God to make an impact in those around me. Well, how how am I going to make uh, relationships with those around me if I'm not around very many people? Um, I know that's tougher in the age that we're in with the uh, coronavirus, but this too will pass. Uh, and if we're not careful, uh, we'll allow the world's thinking to seep in and and we'll forget what we're placed on this earth for, and that's to interact with people and share the good news about Jesus with them. Um, but before we get there, uh, we want to uh, find out how is it that so many were sustained for so long to continue for, not just for a moment, for a lifetime, and share in their faith in Jesus. So uh, I'm kind of calling this session, if you will, the last time together, the not-so-secret secret. And the reason that um, we're calling it a secret is because Paul called it a secret for one thing, but it's but he's also saying it's not so secret at all. And it's really in, in finding joy in the Lord, and just there was something about Paul. He had that 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 edge, and uh, we know a lot of it, yes, this was background, and probably too much gets gets put on that, that is uh, who he was before he became a Christian, uh, but the all the difference in the world was made on that road to Damascus when he, um, the Lord Jesus, met him and uh, in a one-on-one -on -one encounter. Paul, his name was Saul at the time, surrendered his life, um, that uh, he became Paul, and Paul means little, you know. And I, I had the privilege of starting the session off, and I, I may refer back to some of that because it came out of Acts 16, um, and what kind of relationships that Paul was able able to uh, make there in Philippi with Lydia, the rich entrepreneurial lady, um, the young girl who was um, demon possessed, but also the the, the Philippian jailer that he had all different kind of people that he was able to make a impact on from different backgrounds. and uh, But I, what what made him able to relate to so many people? Uh, it certainly was that people were just drawn to him, as some people have some type of natural charisma, you know? Um, and some might even say, well, what makes somebody charismatic or cool, you know? Um, you know, the gospel's never been cool, but there does seem to be something... To, to these people that God used, not only in the, in the scriptures, but uh, in, in church history as well, that God from time to time will use sometimes the most unlikely people. And I, I, I contend that they're cool and there's something cool about them. So what, what I think every you know 14 year old boy wants to know what makes somebody cool. And it's, uh, um, it's what I'll say, is you see it here in this scriptures is not the way the world sees as cool. Uh, but it's everything to do with what Paul will talk about in the word contentment. That they're content, they're confident, but they're not passive or laid back. They're competitive. There's st there's still an edge to them. And I'll just leave you with those three thoughts there. That somebody who's truly cool is somebody who's co is content. That they can, you know, they're not rattled very easily. And also to mean that they're all right with where they are. Uh, someone who's confident that they uh, they can that they keep their head, um, and also someone who's competitive. They they've got that edge. Paul clearly had it. Um, and you speak of being cool. You know, back in the day when that, when I was a teenager, 
uh, video games were just getting started. Of course, now video games are just a totally different reality now. I've got two sons that um, that their uh, knowledge and view of video games is so much different than mine was. Back then, back in the day, we had this thing called an Atari. It was this big brown console thing. And you put the game, it was about that big, and you put it in the in the slot there, and it uh, you probably had like six games, but boy, everybody wanted an Atari for Christmas, and it was just um, just awesome. You had Asteroids, you had different games and stuff like that. Um, later on, those you, those went away, and you had Nintendo, and you had to have Duck Hunt, and you had to have all these other games that are now retro and nostalgia, and just after a while. They kind of wore out. Um, we, um, of course, we had sports back in the day. We had real sports. You had a sports season. You know, you had football season. Then you had basketball season. You had baseball season. Um, the kids don't have that nowadays. That's been transmorphed into continual, very lucrative for those who run them travel ball uh, uh, games, and that's just an entire industry that's so. Divorced from what it was originally. My, my kids couldn't believe it when I told them back in the day that cartoons only came on on Saturday mornings, except maybe for Flintstones when we first got cable in the afternoon. Now you can sit down and watch a four-hour version of of whatever, you know, SpongeBob or uh, Teen Titans Go or whatever that might be uh, what they want at any time. Cartoons are continual. There was no cartoon network back in the day. We didn't have cell phones. Um, if somebody later on got a, you know, when they did, they got one of these big jokers like this that was bigger than their head. And then the only, you know, people got pagers, but, you know, they were automatically assumed to be a drug dealer. You know, the thing vibrated, it might break your, break your hip. Um, we didn't have remote controls back in the day. You know what was the remote control? My brother and I, you know, we went and changed the channel for dad. Um, and, but it just seems the once you get to something and now you've got this, now you've got to get a bigger gadget. You've got to get a bigger screen TV. You've got to get what well, it goes on and on and on. And no one is content with anything anymore. And Paul said he didn't have to have anything. He was good. And somehow he had learned a secret. And I'll, again, I'll call it the not so secret secret that God has given us already everything we need and our contentment is not in our circumstances as the world says, you gotta have the next newest thing. Our contentment is from a relationship that we have in Christ. So how did Paul learn it? Well, we're gonna be in Philippians. If you got your Bibles with you, uh, if you don't, go ahead, pause the video for a second, grab your, grab your Bible, grab a pen, take some notes here as we go through this together. But in uh, chapter four, Philippians, Beginning in verse 11, Paul says this, Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. He's saying, I've learned the secret of being content. Um, I've learned that I don't need all these things, whether it's things when I've been around great abundance, uh, there's things when I've been hungry, I still am good. And it was a way that he had learned contentment that's not natural. It's not the way we learned it. And, and we also think about too, contentment is just not natural to us as human beings. It's not natural to us as, as kids, and we, it's something we have to learn over time. And I, it's hard for us when we read this, we're reading it in English, but there's a way to understand this in the original language, in the Greek, that uh, we don't automatically pick up, but it's clear in the, in the original language of, of Greek. That's why we, when we study our Bibles, when you study your Bible, there's so much access now to, to translations and, and original meanings to great Bible software and apps and things like that, like uh, Bible, uh, Blue, Blue Letter Bible and so many others. Uh, Logos is another. But uh, there's really two different ideas here that Paul is trying to convey. One is the first way that he is trying to say contentment 
is a is something is a not so secret secret that can be learned is intellectually. And you do have there there is something about learning the content of what the Bible has to say. He learned the rules of contentment. And he's he's learning them mentally as as hopefully we all are. And you're learning it right now as as you're you're hearing this and think about this and you're reading this in your in your Bibles and hopefully this is what's what you see here in verses eleven through thirteen is just leaping off the page to you right now. God wants you to be content, but it's not going to be something that's the what's clear to you from what the world is teaching. You're not going to find it from yourself, and certainly Satan is not going to show it to you with what he's trying to sell you. Contentment is something that's supernatural. But we learn and gain it first from our minds and what we hear from the truth. Um, and I think Paul, when he was thinking, this is how to be content. He was, he was a Pharisee. He was, he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He knew the word, and I'm sure he would have thought of Habakkuk three seventeen through nineteen. It says this: Though the fig tree shall not blossom, and there be no fruit on the vines, though the Yield, uh, the, though the yield of the olives should fail and the fields produce no food, though the flock should be cut off from the fold and there be no cattle in the stalls, yet I will exalt in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord is my strength and he has made my feet like hinds feet and makes me walk on high places. That he learned the secret as the as the writer of Habakkuk did as well, that it doesn't matter if I have uh, food that's out in the fields. It doesn't matter if the olive tree doesn't give any oil because they were so, I mean, think about that culture too, agricultural uh, means so that they were so dependent upon what happened at harvest. Well, of course, you talk to any farmer, anybody, you know, there's that if it doesn't happen, then they could spend the next whole year in poverty, and that affects the next cycle. So they are totally dependent upon the Lord in that way. But at the same time, you and I are dependent upon the Lord that we don't need to trust in how we think or how we feel. We need to trust in what he says. And that's learning contentment in an intellectual sense. Um, David, um, the King David said this as well in Psalm 63, verse 3. Your steadfast love is better than life. Psalm 4, 7. You have put my, more joy in my heart than when we have grain and wine abound. That who cares if I have a full bank account, if I don't have much, very much in the bank, what matters most is I have the presence of God in my life. And as you know, as Psalm 16, 11, many of you around me hear, hear me say that a lot. It's just, it's just so important to me. You're, and your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. That uh, you want the ultimate joy also, contentment, it comes from being in God's presence. And we forget it from time to time, especially in these days when so much is screaming at us to be afraid and, and here's something else to be wary about and that kind of thing. And if we're not careful, the message that this is sending to us is that your contentment is going to be found in your safety and how secure you are and how well you are. It's not all those things are going to go away. We're eventually all going to die. We're all eventually gonna, not going to have anything in our bank account. It's going to go to somebody else. So why are we so consumed with having that? I believe it's because we don't we haven't learned the secret yet. Or maybe like me, you're, you've been a believer for a long time, and maybe you've forgotten, and you remember, or you just need to be reminded. I hope this helps. Um, so it's it's and it'll, you do it's like anything with the, you do have to learn these things. In the mind, and that comes from reading it, hearing it, trying to process it. Maybe process it with other believers. Maybe read some good books on the subject, commentaries, that kind of thing. So it's an intellectual thing, but it's not just intellectual. It has to be experiential. That some of us really don't learn something until we actually try it. You know, I can hear all day long that a ghost pepper is hot, right? I can understand that con that 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 concept that if I eat this, my 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 face might melt, right? But it's not, and some of us might have to experience it. Hopefully not. But put it positively. And in, in verse 12, what does he say? What does Paul say? I have learned the secret. He already knew it. In verse 11, he's already saying, I already knew it up here. And I think it's a lot of us, as far as believers, I think we give ourselves too much of a harder time because there's things maybe we learned as we grew up in church or something we learned 
um, and um, as a teenager, but didn't really nail it down till college. And we might think, hey, I was a believer then or whatever. Um, no, it, it's just something you you knew, but you had to you had to get it to heart because now it has to be experienced. And that's what Paul was saying, that I have learned the secret. He has, by experience, learned the lesson that he knew intellectually. See, Paul, uh, go back to Acts 16 for a second and read that or go back to that first session. Paul had learned to be content when he was in the middle of Beverly Hills there with Lydia, you know, that Lydia was a CEO of, of, a, of a, a fashion empire. She was a fashionista, and but she was a woman who'd come to Christ through Paul's ministry, and now she's using her means um, to share the gospel through both hospitality, but also through making, you know, making sure the gospel's sent out all through Philippi. And he was able to sit in the midst of all that opulence and all that great wealth. And he says, you know what? This is great. But knowing and loving Jesus is better. Following him is far better than any of this. Um, well, and some of us, I mean, I think some of us in America will learn this. And you say, hey, you're, of course you'll learn this because you live in America. or You, you live in a place of abundance. You live in, in some of the most unprecedented times that people have seen. So, of course, you'll be thinking that way, that, you know, you're you're joyful and you're content because you have all this. But what Paul was able to do, do with abundance, he was also able to do, and, you know, short, enjoy that for a short time, but also able to do when he was in poverty. Um, but what we learn is that contentment means being satisfied not with the gift, but with the giver. You know, years ago, John Piper said, you know, that the, one of the greatest um, gambles God made was to give, to give us gifts. Because what happens is that we worship the gift instead of the giver. And the giver of all these gifts that we have is is God alone. We wouldn't have anything. Even the wicked person, the person who just denies God altogether, uh, maybe he or she got it through evil means, um, they're still enjoying temporary blessings here on earth. Where'd that come from? It came from God. But what happens is when God's not the center of your universe, uh, other things will become the center. So you worship those gifts instead of the one who gave them to you or allowed you to have them. So money doesn't satisfy, but more is the desire. The word more is, is a desire that never ends. You know, the Famous quote from Henry Ford is, you know, is how much money is enough? And he was, he said, well, one, one more dollar, you know. Um, the, the, the need and the desire for more. Um, the right, you know, Gary Thomas, famous writer, he called it, you know, the, the contentment becomes a discipline. You have to train your mind. Because you know what, intellectually, well, experientially, you might get bitten in the rear end because you realize your contentment was in your stuff instead of God alone. So what we learn through those tough times is a discipline of contentment that I don't need to be so consumed with what I have or I don't have yet or I, I won't have it all. Um, I heard someone here recently just talking about um, just failed expectations and dreams that they have for their life. And, you know, they're almost in tears and just angry that some of those just got squashed. And, uh, and they were almost, in a, like, in a sense, demanding that these things happen. Well, you know, that's, that's coming from an uh, expectation that God's going to give me everything I, I, I've ever wanted. That's not true. You know, those, those desires, the, the truth is, is that those desires that we have have to be laid at the feet of Jesus. You know, Psalm 37, 4, you know, delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. That doesn't mean you get uh, a brand new Mercedes or you get the nice, beautiful cabin in the mountains that, that you've always wanted. What it, it may mean, though, is that you get him and he's got to be enough. And he's better than, he's better than all these dreams and expectations. That's, that, it's kind of when we realize that there'll never be enough excitement or enough money that's going to quiet our hearts. Um, we'll never have as much as we want. This has been true from the beginning of time. I know taking my kids to um, 
to uh, Dollywood to I remember when they were kids. And, man, they would get on one ride and ride the same ride over and over and over again. They couldn't re- wait to get off, and if there wasn't a big crowd, get right back on again. Well, that got old after a while, and then they want to do something better, and then something bigger. Um, I remember <laughs> when we were young, we, uh, or my kids were younger, and this was about 10 years ago, and we went to um, – to Disney World, and I remember we just we we had the time and uh, the way it worked. You, you bought a day pass, and if you went another day, the price got cheaper, and it got cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Or by the I don't know by the tenth day, we wanted to see everything. You know, one of my kids is like, "Can we go home?" You know, it's um, it gets after a while. Your contentment and excitement alone can't be enough. It reminds me of. Augustine, uh, the early church um, father who said, you know, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee. Our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee. Um, Stephen Altrogi said this, we won't be fully satisfied when we get what we want because God loves us and wants us to find our satisfaction in him. He won't allow us to be satisfied, to believe that we'll finally be happy when we get what we want is a lie. So what about when we have less? What about that? Not, we've talked about having everything we want. What about when we have less? Paul showed, hey, I could, I can be just as fine in Lydia's house, but I can be also too when I've uh, and when I've learned to live, uh, not live life as a wealthy man. I'm okay when I'm in a prison cell, uh, or I'm I'm in the middle of of uh, being questioned about my faith, all these things, he was, okay, wealth was not Paul's God. You know, he's, he's, um, he's on one day he's uh, at Lydia's house and eating a, a, a awesome filet, you know, and, and then he was talking about the next day that he cast a demon out of a little girl. And then the next night he's beaten up and put in prison and thrown in the stocks, and how he got to share Christ with that jailer. Um, he said, I, I know how to live in great wealth. I know how to be poor. I know that even having nothing, even being imprisoned, um, and I know how also to have all those terrible things happen and not go over into despair because of it. I mean, remember, he had his back uh, split open uh, with a cat of nine tails five times. I mean, he could talk about being almost be being you know being left for dead, and still being content with Christ being enough. When he could have demanded justice, he could have demanded that his rights be met, and all these kinds of things. He didn't do that. He says to know in Christ is enough. The true contentment. This is, here's the secret: is not in any way related to my circumstances. True contentment is tuned to the deeper reality of the good news about Jesus and his present and coming kingdom that that's that's the secret that we are we are in it but not of it that we are part of what we of something that's that's here but not seen but coming quickly and it's the kingdom his kingdom and we can say to God open-handed it doesn't matter if you bless me abundantly or if I am the wretches of society Either way, if I got wealth, I'm going to praise the Lord. I'm going to push his kingdom forward and use, as Lydia did, um, use that that money that you've blessed me with to, to push the kingdom forward because it's got to take money. I'm going to glorify him anyway. And he says, all he's saying, I'm is yours. If I'm poor, I'm yours. I'll trust you. And I'll just commit, just think about, i got my hands open. Think about an open hand. Paul kept open hands to the Lord. It was open on one hand if he was in uh, uh, great wealth type situations or he had an open hand whenever he was in poor circumstances. The main thing is that his hands were open to the Lord and it's saying, I'll, uh, whatever God, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. And it takes, it takes work to keep that hand open. It's a discipline, just like Gary Thomas said. Popularity didn't matter to him. It doesn't matter if they love me or hate me. I got Jesus. He's got me. I'm good. It didn't matter if he had good health. 
Uh, remember, he had a, a thorn in the flesh. They prayed for it three times that God would take it away. And God didn't, you know, that what did God tell him? My grace is sufficient for thee. Um, you know, godliness with contentment is great gain. We have made such a God of health that God loves you and wants you to be healthy and happy. And one of the gr- worst things I think, or maybe I should say this, one of the big spotlights I think that we as Christians need to take a look at uh, is, is a spotlight on our safety and security because that's going to be one of the great tempting points of the evil one in the latter days that we have so much made our health a God that I'm afraid that, it's, that we've been laid bare to see what we are. Um, as opposed to the contentment that Paul clearly had. I remember 25 years ago, um, just finished with, um, with college, and I spent a summer with some other college students in Mexico City. And I think I left, when I left from there, I was 225 pounds. And when I came back, I was 205. And what what happened was is that I ate at a Pizza Hut, you know. It wasn't the taco stands or anything. I mean, I ate at those, but I ate at a Pizza Hut and got deathly ill uh, there. And um, I remember just being on, I was on a, I was laying on, we were at this dorm, and we used to stay at these dorms, and um, I was laying on top of this bed because we had to push the beds together because I'm 6'4", and I had to lay diagonal across the bed because it didn't have a bed long enough for me, you know? And so I'm laying diagonal across this bed, and just, I mean, I, I mean, I can't even get up and go to the bathroom anymore. I mean, I'm just, I'm dying. And, um, and I just remember laying there, my, my, my prayer began to be, Lord, I don't want to die here. <laughs> Lord, please don't let me die here, you know? Because I, I literally thought, this is, you know, but, um, but what ter- that turned into some of the sweetest fellowship time that I've, I've had with the Lord was being ill, lost almost 20 pounds, being so stinking ill. Um, because, I mean, and it's really what God had been working in my life all the way up to that point. I was engaged to be married. Um, I just asked my, my, my now wife to marry me a few weeks before, prior to that, uh, before we left. But, um, and just just coming back, and I would have people ask me at, at you know, uh, what was your best part about, about, um, about the trip? And I'd say, there was a lot of great things, but one of the best was, was my time with the Lord, and it was most nobly when I was sick. Um, health is not to be, well, wealth was not Paul's God, neither was health. Um, and so any and every circumstances, um, I think we need to remember the fellowship we have with God. Now here, I mean, I love, I got a nice comfy bed. I got a smoking hot wife. I got beautiful kids, you know, uh, got money in the bank account. We've got plenty of food. Um, I'm content with Christ there as well. Um, I'm not saying that we should just hope for the worst. At the same time, we should not allow our circumstances determine our, cont- our, our contentment. We are to rejoice in every circumstances. And we can say, just as Paul said, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. All things. All things means the great adversity, but also the great, um, the great times of blessing. So that's first off. Learn contentment. And it's intellectual, but it's also experiential. You got to get out there and experience time alone with him. All right, so what's, what's going to keep me going? That's, that, I guess uh, the thought there in these first three verses is I need to learn contentment now. It's going to be learned over time. Uh, I've got to get involved in my walk with the Lord and in life and experience that discipline. Make sure that I'm, I'm making sure that contentment is a discipline I carried out in my, in my life, whether things are great or whether things are terrible. But what's going to keep me going? What's, what's my vision? What's going to keep me down the road uh, abandoning all this? What if I get to my, as I, I'm, I'm middle-aged now, if I get to my middle-aged my middle age time of my, my life and go, ah, forget it. Or you see so many people that are in their, their, their seniors. I was he- hearing someone talk about some great um, heroes of the faith, you know, that um, A.W. Pink, for example, didn't attend church 
because he couldn't find one per perfect enough for him in the, in the last several years of his life. A.W. Tozer was another. You know, we can, uh, so it doesn't, you can learn all this stuff intellectually, but if it doesn't change your heart and you find contentment in the Lord and, you know, it can turn you into something you wish you would, were not. So what's going to keep me going? It's, it better not be the, 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 ex, the, the experiential things here on earth that I know. I'm, I know I'm going to be disappointed. You know, sure, Paul was disappointed. I mean, he loved this church at Philippi, but they, they disappointed him. What's going to keep me going? Well, he unpacks it more in these last verses of the whole book of Philippians, of chapter 4, and he calls it you know, these riches and glory. That Paul's point, he, he kind of summarizes it all up here, and the learning of advice, he had helpful skills. He, he had his point summed up in just the fact of uh, knowing God, but he had all these skills that he learned all along the way on how to do this, how to walk with the Lord, how to study Scripture, how to, how to, um, how to disciple other people, raise up leaders for the church, and then move on to the next place and do the same thing there. Um, if the thing with the riches and glory, if you if you know God, you have a sense of His love and the abundance of grace He has for you in Christ. You're you're consequently you'll find wealth um, appropriately unimpressive and suffering appropriately untroubling. I don't know if that makes sense. One, wealth is appropriately unimpressive, meaning I've got something better than the temporary wealth I got here on earth. But on the other hand, if I go through something that's terrible, horrible, that I'm not going to be overwhelmed with it. I'm not going to be, oh, this is the end of the world as we know it. Um, and I just, I, I got to call some of us out. Some of us in the church today are acting as if all of our life have to st lives have to stop because of this, this coronavirus. And yet we got to be careful. We have to make sure that we aren't um, putting other people in a position where they could get sick. That's not loving. Uh, we also have to, as you know, as Corinthians tells us, to you know, watch out for our weaker brother or weaker sister, not to give them a, uh, uh, give Satan actually an opportunity to tempt them so that they fall. So, yeah, may, we may do some things or have some type of customs like Paul had had to deal with with uh, meat sacrificed to idols. But, you know, at the, at the same time, um, I'm just wondering what Jesus, how he would have handled this epidemic. Because remember what he did with the lepers. Uh, he went to the people that were sick and infirmed. Um, he didn't run away from them, and neither did Paul. Um, I think the same thing should be true with us that the world sees when our contentment is in Christ and not in the world around us. I want us to pick up, not just, um, you know, you're, you're the great, everybody ends with, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, but what about what's after that? Here, here's the next, his next step in the, in the process of, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, verse 14, the end of the chapter, nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my affliction. I can do all things means, yeah, I'm going to experience affliction. That means I'm suffering. Bad things is going to happen. You yourselves also know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel, that after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, but you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek for the profit which increases to your account. But I have received everything in full and have an abundance. I am amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. I mean, it, it just capture real quick what's going on. He was, Paul was in a time of need. All the other churches that he helped start and plant, none of them chose to uh, remember their spiritual daddy there, Paul, but the church in Philippi alone. 
And, and I think he's also saying, I know you gave sacrificially. And when Epaphroditus brought it, we were so grateful. And, but it's, you know, at the same time, I know you gave sacrificially. It's, it's desperately needed for the, for the work. But here's what's going to happen. My God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. That as you have given, so you will be given. And God's going to take care of you. God's going to supply what you need because you have said my riches are in this world. My riches are in heaven. And uh, the same God who owns everything is the same God who will reward maybe, temporar- maybe temporarily here on earth. But I've got so much more waiting on me and glory. So, um, so anyway, just, just think through that. Paul is saying you are content in Christ and because you're content in Christ, that led to these these actions that you're that you're doing, and giving some love to to your friends. That you know people who who <clears throat> have experienced love, have experienced grace, have experienced blessing. They are more aptly amp and uh, more aptly to turn around and do it to someone else. You're you're more likely to give away when you're given to, and you realize it. Um, I think he would have been okay if they hadn't, you know, but they chose to remember their brother. They chose to remember and chose to, in a way, suffer. They knew he was suffering where he was, but they chose to suffer with him by giving to him and making sure that he had what he needed for the ministry. Um, and he, But I think also, too, that he's rejoicing because he knows the fellowship is in full effect, that they are... The fellowship, meaning, yeah, between the two of them, between Paul and the church, but the church back in Philippi is being the church. And it's just a beautiful, the, be- the beauty of the church shines through. They, and Paul, you know, Philippians 2.15 said, you know, you got to shine like lights in the world. They are demonstrating their heavenly fellowship there in, in verse 20 of chapter 3. And he's like, look, you're going to be fully repaid and the world that's to come. Yeah, you, there may be temporary blessings here, but the your sin and you know, as, as Jesus said, you know that uh, that to uh, make sure that you don't put your treasure here on earth, where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal, but that you store up treasure in heaven. And that was their that was their thinking. That was their mindset. And in verse nineteen, there God will supply all of your needs, not their wants necessarily, but their needs. And according to his riches and glory, not their riches, according to his riches, that this is going to be something they would receive, not earn. God will not ask anything of you now. In other words, that he will not pay you back for infinity fold and glory. Not because he owes you a thing, but because he loves you and he's gracious beyond anything we could ever think. Um, that is what keeps us going. That's, that's what keeps us thinking, not just learning contentment now, but there's a time coming very soon that whenever that is, that I'll be with the Lord in glory, that you'll be with the Lord in glory if you have a relationship with him, that the, the riches, I mean, just think of the richest person that you know of. You know, the Bill Gates of the world, the Jeff Bezos, the whoever, all these, all these people, Elon Musk, all these people that have such great wealth that they look like beggars compared to your spiritual daddy who created the universe and he owns it all. And what the scripture says too, he's, he's making you a co-heir with Christ, that the, the earth and the universe belong to him and you... It's like someone reading a will at the end and you find out what you inherit, you're going to get it all. Um, the second advent is coming. The first happened when Jesus came the first time. Uh, that was Christmas. Um, the Jewish people were looking for a Messiah and they kept looking. They missed Jesus, but Jesus came exactly when he said he was going to. He went to the cross and on the cross he became the he became sin for us as second corinthians 5 tells us he actually became my sin and your sin and it was on the cross too that uh, he absorbed all of our judgment 
that all the penalty, everything that you're supposed to get, that I'm supposed to get, that he took all that on himself, that penalty that was due to you for eternity, Jesus took on himself for those three hours. And only Je- it was something, first of all, only Jesus could do, that he's the only one qualified to endure that amount of suffering and punishment um, for me and for you. Um, but he was also the only one who was able to rise again from the grave three days later, just like he said he would, to put death to death, as the scripture says in 1 Corinthians 15, that the you know death no longer has a sting. There's no more penalty uh, for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so ha- having done that, disease has lost its power. Um, sin has lost its power because of what he did on the cross. And there's eternal riches that come with that. And we kind of live in between those two advents, those two times, the time when Jesus would come the first time and the time that I believe is coming real fast, just pay attention to the news even today, that Jesus will return. And we're kind of that narrow part, that in-between time. And uh, in that in-between time, we're called to learn true contentment. And it's the contentment we're going to have beyond anything we could ever count when we get to be with him in glory. And he's going to return one day and... It's going to be a pretty scary event for most of the human beings that are still alive at that time. The Bible talks about that most of mankind will want the mountains to fall on them, to, and they will try to flee from the from the what they call the wrath of the Lamb. That Jesus is not coming the, as He did the first time. He came as a gentle, suffering, truth-speaking servant. The second time He's coming to judge. And all of us, we've exalted ourselves. We've been so narcissistic. And there's going to be a time when every, every wayward word, every thought because that's going to be brought and put into, put into full view and focus. And because basically what we said and said to God, forget you, God. I'm smarter than you. I'll do what I want. And uh, I think that the perspective that we got to have is um, – People that are a whole lot more um, godly, more spiritual, uh, have seen things that you and I perhaps have not seen, uh, have seen God and fall to the ground absolutely mortified and terrified. Um, you know, Moses believed that, you know, he, how can I see God and live? You know, God, remember, put, put Moses in the cleft of the rock and just caused his, the, his backside as he placed his hand over to so he wouldn't die. Think about Isaiah, that when you know God, Isaiah was a godly man, and in the year as Isaiah six says, in the year that King Uzziah died, he says, "I saw the Lord," and it says, you know, it says he fell at his feet like a dead man. Um, and he says, "Woe to me, for I'm a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips." Um, and you just think, you know, as as someone like John, John who wrote. The, the Gospel John and Revelation, uh, according to tradition, is that he was bold alive and and still lived. Um, and, you know, he was exiled to the island of Patmos, and it says he sees the Lord there. And, uh, you know, upon threat of persecution, all the disciples, none of them said, hey, wait, 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 we made it all up. It was all a lie. None of those people did that. Um, they saw the Lord and saw what Jesus did after he raised again from the dead. And that day when Jesus returns, what we're going to want that day, when that big file drawer opens up and every thought, deed that we've ever um, ever had is going to be laid bare, uh, we're going to want to see someone take care of that. And if it's not taken care of, then we have to. And... If we have to take care of that, if you as an individual have to take care of that on your own, the way it's taken care of is to spend an eternity in hell paying for each one of those sins forever. It's awful. The Bible describes hell as a place of fire, of loneliness, of 
burning sulfur, um, of dread, of suffering, unimaginable. That any of it, no horror movie even comes close to it today. It's a place of darkness. So, would you rather have you pay for pay for everything in that massive file drawer forever, or on that day, that second Advent, that when all that's brought, none of it's even brought up because Jesus says, "I took care of all that." I paid the price for all of that. He's mine. I'm his. You're going to want to have that kind of contentment. And maybe you don't have that kind of contentment right now. Maybe you don't know what would happen to you if this was your day or this was the day that Jesus would return to earth just like he said he was. You can have that contentment of knowing that just what Jesus meant when he said on the cross, it is finished, that he said it is paid in full. You can have that contentment right now if you would surrender your heart to Christ right here, right now, where you are, and trust what he did for you on the cross 2,000 years ago and ask him to forgive you of all your sins, past, present, and future, that whole file cabinet he promises that he would pay the price for. Um, and then moving on from that, and you can do, first of all, if you have it, you can do it right where you are right now. Just press pause and give your heart to Jesus. But if you already have giving your heart to Jesus, well, are you, have you left just that one moment? You know, maybe you're a believer and you've just forgotten and, and your contentment has become your health. You know, how much, how much, I mean, how much, uh, how much have we been just lied to that happiness means being healthy? Or how much have we been lied to that happiness being, means having more money and more and more money. Or maybe it's something else. Maybe it's something going on in your family that happiness means this. No, happiness, true commitment, being cool, confident, competent, uh, competitive means being uh, content, that Jesus is enough. Many, many of us Christians, we got it intellectually, we know too much, but we practice way too little. And just think, get this perspective too. Not just the, but that's the, the, what I told you earlier is the future perspective. Think about the past perspective. Now for the last 2,000 years, this Christianity thing has just happened. I mean, it, it started, yes, with the resurrection of Jesus and it continued with the Holy Spirit being given there at Pentecost and the, the gospel just exploding. I mean, even after Stephen was persecuted and killed and murdered, you think that would have been enough just to stop it right there, but it just kept going. And think about you know the, the 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 fact that this gospel came to Philippi, and from Philippi it went somewhere else. It's just happened over and over again. But I, I guarantee you, you can probably trace, if you're a believer, your salvation back to what happened here um, in Philippi and so many other places in the early church. It spread throughout there, not just Asia, but through Europe and Africa and. The South America, North America. Just think, ask the question, how did the gospel get to maybe New England as my, as, as my ancestors came to Virginia and then North Carolina, Georgia, and South Carolina, and somehow the gospel got to me? Somehow the gospel got to you. And if the gospel can do that over all those barriers, over all those many years, and it's, as the gospel is promised in Matthew 24, 12, that it's going to continue to the ends of the earth and then the end will come, that every nation is going to get to hear, then whatever we're going through, whatever you might be going through, he's going to supply all your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus to make sure that message gets out, gets clear. You can join Paul, you can join Lydia, this little girl, um, the jailer, me, others who have surrendered to Christ, countless, millions, and say with the same, same thing, I count all things to be loss, refuse, compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord. And we can say to live is truly Christ and to die is comparable infinite gain, and I can be content with that. 
How about you today? I hope this has been a great study. Please feel free to send us your thoughts. Um, and I'll just in, encourage you to maybe sit down and, and go through back through these videos. Maybe just write down some key thoughts. Like the key thought from today is that learning Christ, uh, or excuse me, learning contentment is, um, is something I learned here that you know to to have Christ is is my is my contentment, but I need to experience that. Maybe I need to think about the future riches I've got in Christ. But just write down some some key things, and uh, and allow Christ to transform you. I've enjoyed it. I hope y'all have a great great rest of the day. And let me pray for us, Father. We thank you again for Jesus. Thank you for the contentment that we have in Him. That. Um, that through the power also of the Holy Spirit, constantly pointing the finger and the attention upon Him, that um, that we can truly find, no, no matter what our circumstances may be, we can find true contentment in the middle of great bl blessing and great suffering. That you, Lord, are enough. Lord, I pray for anybody here today, uh, is hear, hearing this, listening to this, that they would surrender their lives to you, that they would escape the wrath to come, and realize that, Lord, you loved us so much that you sent your only son uh, to die on the cross so that anyone who believes in him will not perish to experience that wrath forever, uh, but have everlasting life. God, we love you. Thank you again. And help us to find true joy and true contentment in Jesus alone. In whose name we pray. Amen.